Hey guys, it's the BC Anders Critiquer, and today we'll be looking at another work commonly read in high school and a milestone towards having predominantly non-white casts in media, that being a raisin in the sun. It's the story of the Youngers, a late 1950s African-American family consisting of elderly Lena Younger, her two adult children Walter and Benita, and Walter's wife Ruth and young son Travis. They're all rooming together to barely make ends meet in their crapple apartment, and while Ruth is cool with the poverty-stricken life as long as she has her loved ones, the rest of them want more in the world, but in different ways. Walter wants to run a multi-million dollar liquor store with his best buds, Benita wants to go to medical school and be a doctor, and Lena wants a nicer house for the family. And when Lena receives a 10 grand life insurance check following the recent passing of her husband, it looks like their dreams are pretty close to achievements. While initially reluctant to fund Walter's liquor store dream, being a devout Christian, she eventually says screw it, and after purchasing a new house in a formerly all-white neighborhood called Clybourne Park, she gives the remaining money for Walter to invest half in a bank for Benita's medical school education and the rest to use for his liquor store. The youngers are totally psyched about their good fortune, and not even when the racist community tries to bribe them into not moving in are they deferred. Only thing is, it turns out Walter gave all of the leftover money for his friend Willie Harris to invest in the liquor store, including the money for Benita's medical school tuition. But that's okay, with all the money he'll make from the liquor store, he can pay us this back in no time. And Willie's Walter's best friend, he never let him down. Uh, Woody? This play is notable for a lot of things. It was the first play written by an African-American woman to be produced on Broadway, it had over 530 performances in its original run, and it was my second favorite story to have to read in high school English after Lord of the Flies. Speaking of which, its huge success meant a couple film adaptations were inevitable. The first in 1961 for theaters, with most of the cast from the original stage production reprising their roles, including Lorraine Hansberry as the screenwriter, and another in 2008 for television, with most of the cast from the 2004 revival reprising their roles. Both stayed true to the play, but also added a few additional scenes in different locations to better suit the story for film. Oh yeah, and there's also this 1989 TV adaptation that's pretty much forgotten. But the other two adaptations were pretty well received, but of course we have to ask which one holds up better. Well, that's what I'm here to find out. This is Old vs. New, A Raisin in the Sun. First, we'll be looking at our hero, or anti-hero rather, a guy named Walter who loves his wife and son at the end of the day, but whose greed blinds him into doing some pretty terrible things. Uh, no, not that one. Let's look at the one I'm talking about with Bess Walter. <laughs> Walter Younger is the husband and father of the Younger family and more or less the main character of the story. In the original he's played by Sidney Poitier and in the remake it's Sean Combs. Now before I get into which one I like better, there's something we need to discuss about Walter. While he is a good person at the end of the day and loves his family, he's got some pretty negative traits about him as well. He's greedy, self-absorbed, rude, short-tempered, and in the third act, he frickin' takes the money that was supposed to be for Benita's tuition and puts it into funding his liquor store, even after Lena already gave him a good chunk of the money for just that. So as you can imagine, there needs to be some sort of natural likability to the character in his performance to make us care about him at all. Yeah, he redeems himself at the end, but I don't think that's quite enough after how he treats his family for most of the movie. If he's not nice, then he at least has to be enjoyable. So which incarnation seems to have more charm despite being a jerk? Well, I'd have to say Sidney Poitier's. In most of his scenes, the guy's just breaking every Hollywood ham record ever set at the time. Damn these eggs! Damn all the eggs that ever was. Who the hell told you you had to be a doctor? You're so interested in messing around with sick people going out of here and be a nurse. Like other women, or get married and shut up. Just look at how he reacts when Bobo tells him that Willie's run off with the money for their liquor store. What are you doing? 
you mean Willie is gone? Gone where? You mean he went on down there by himself to take care of getting the license? You mean he went to Springfield by himself? Maybe you were late yesterday and he went on down there without you. Or maybe he's sick. He's somewhere, man. He's somewhere. We gotta find him, you hear me? We gotta find him. Poitier's over-the-top performance may distract a little from some of the more dramatic scenes like the one we just saw, but it's just so much fun on the whole that I can't help but love the guy even if he is a self-righteous prick. Sean Combs is a good actor, but his Walter doesn't seem to have that natural charm the character needs. Combs plays the character as more restrained and sullen, and when he is over the top, he just seems mean instead of funny. You don't see no stars out there gleaming, you just can't reach out and grab. You happy. You contend with some of these bitches. You gotta be mad. I had the world hand to see you on a silver platter. You're damn right I'm bitter. Now don't get me wrong, Combs does offer a little charisma and humor with this performance, just not very much. Because of this, it's much harder to sympathize with Combs' Walter after all the terrible things he does in the story. Poitier's Walter does some terrible things as well, but thanks to his hilarious performance, he still manages to be more likable and easier to forgive at the end of the story. Point goes to the old. You better be lying! You better be lying! Obnoxious punks do drive a lot of people crazy, but the one person they drive the craziest is probably their little sister if they have one. Believe me, my little sister can vouch for that. And ours is no exception, but in spite of that and all the other hardships they face, they still manage to stay strong. So let's see which one stayed stronger with Best Benita. <laughs> Beneath the Younger, played by Diana Sands and Sana Lathan in each film respectively, was and continues to be an awesome role model for girls all ages. Sure, she's sassy, cynical, and looks down on religion, but she's also smart, strong-willed, fun-loving, and dreams of challenging racial and gender norms of the time by becoming a doctor. I guess she's kind of like the Lisa Simpson of the younger siblings to Walter's Bart. And for the most part, both actresses capture these traits pretty damn well in their performances, so it's no easy choice to choose which one of them I like better. But I guess if I had to choose which performance comes off stronger, I'd have to lean towards Sana Lathan's. As great as Diana Sands does in the role, her performance seems a little too restrained at times. Like, compare this line in both movies. This, friends, is the welcoming committee. This, friends, is the welcoming committee. Or how about this one? No, oh, Mama, neither is God. I get sick of hearing about God all the time. Beneath Well, neither is God. I get sick of hearing about God. Beneath it. Again, for the most part, Sans is awesome, but every now and then she just seems a little too underwhelming for my liking. That, and no disrespect to Sans, but she just looks a little... meek, for lack of a better word. Not tremendously, she's just not the first thing I'd think of if you mentioned a strong-willed gal who won't take crap from anyone. Lathan definitely is, though. She could even give Disney's Esmeralda a run for her money at times. My people were the first people on Earth to smell iron. The Ashanti were performing surgical operations when the English were still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. That, and she does seem to smile a bit more in this version, showing that she's able to stay stronger when things look tough. That's really all I got for this one, because again, both performances are really damn good. I just think Lathan's has the slightest of upper hands at the end of the day. Point goes to the new. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. <laughs> When you're going through a hard time in your life, it's important to have good family and friends to support you. So let's see who was behind our two leads the longest with Best Supporting Cast. We should probably start with Ruth, the wife and mother of the family, a uh, second generation wise that is, and probably the most level headed of the bunch. Both incarnations only have so much patience for the antics of their families, but really do love them and try to give emotional support whenever they can. And both Ruby Dee and Audra McDonald do really damn well in the role, so it's really hard to find anything to compare with them. But since I have to pick one of them, I'd say McDonald's portrayal has a little more moxie and drive to her. Like compare these scenes. I'll work 20 hours a day, and all the kids in Chicago. 
I'll strap my baby on my back if I have to. Lena, I will work 20 hours a day if I have to. I will strap my baby to my back if I have to. But Lena, we gotta move. What about Walter and Ruth's son, Travis? Well, neither version has much character outside of being the innocent little kid of the family, but the original's performance is a bit more cutesy and thus more memorable. How about Benita's boyfriend, Asagai? Both are very supportive lovers for Benita, and it's amazing how much they're willing to tolerate her family's embarrassing behavior. I guess if I had to choose, though, I'd probably go with the original again. He had a playful, smart-ass sense of humor to him, which made him more fun to watch. Well, it's true that this is not so much the profile of a Hollywood queen as, say, the Queen of the Nile, huh? <laughs> well, what does it matter? Assimilationism is so popular in your country. Though Walter's best friend Bobo has done much better in the new film, the one in the original is okay, but Bill Nunn definitely fits the lovable big guy persona a lot better. But the tipping point for me is Lena, the stern but caring first-generation mother of the younger family. Both performances are phenomenal, but I feel Claudia McNeil's portrayal leans a little too much in the stern and abrasive side of the character. Now you say after me, in my mother's house there is still God. Not that she didn't have any kind moments, she just came off as a bit too harsh for my liking. Felicia Rashad's version balances out the abrasiveness and kindness of the character much better, so she comes off as far more likable. Factoring all that in, it seems like the new version has the upper hand with the supporting cast, though only by a nudge. Point goes to the new. Lord have mercy. Ain't this the living go? <laughs> In my opinion, the worst kind of bad guy out there is one that seems charming and accepting, but has a secretly politically incorrect agenda. It's not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking. You sick SOB. And ours is no exception, so let's see which one is more effective with Best Villains. <laughs> Our big bad of the story is Carl Lindner, a rep from the Clybourne Park HOA who's been chosen to represent the community in telling the Youngers as politely as possible that they don't want non-white people in their community and are willing to pay them more than what they originally paid to not move in. And coincidentally, both actors share the same first name. In the original, we have John Fiedler, the original voice of Piglet and Rudy from The Emperor's New Groove, and in the remake, we have John Stamos, the star of the Fox sitcom Grandfathered. At first glance, it might seem a little out of place to hear Piglet's voice coming from a racist bigot trying to convince the Youngers that segregation is in their best interest. Believe me, I want you to believe me when I tell you that, that race prejudice simply doesn't enter into it. Now, it's, it's a matter of the, of the people of Clyburn Park believing now, now rightly or wrongly, as I say, that, that for the happiness of all concerned, well, that, that our uh, Negro families are, are happier when they live in their own communities. But I actually think that works perfectly with Lindner's character. Let's face it, racism does often have a subtle nature to it, and manipulators usually do come off as totally genuine to deceive people with their lies. So it really helps that Fiedler comes off a lot like his future character Piglet in this performance, what with his charming timidness and stuttering problem, as well as the supposed gentle nature of Piglet, all craftily shrouding the rotten racist he really is. Not that the youngers fell for his crap, but he was trying to be a stealthy bad guy. John Stamus' Lindner is a little too obvious. He always feels like a sleazy car salesman, and he does a pretty bad job at hiding his contempt for the youngers. And that's why I was elected, to come out and, uh, you know, talk to you people, uh, friendly-like, as, as people should talk to one another, and see, um, you know, if we, can, uh, if we can just work this thing out. For one thing, he just walks into their house without even knocking, and where the original spends almost six minutes beating around the bush before breaking it to the youngers that they're not wanted in their community, this one spends only about three at best, showing that he's not as interested in seeming genuine. So yeah, he's not the master of subtlety. Anyway, there's also another villain with less screen time but still a pretty big impact, that being Willie Harris, Walter and Bobo's supposed best friend who convinces them to give him a ton of money to invest in a liquor store but then flees town with it all, hurting the youngers especially because Walter happened to give him all of the remaining money from the insurance check. 
There's not as much material to compare with him, seeing how he only appears for one short scene in both movies, but it's kind of the same thing as with Lindner. The one in the TV version feels so smug and slimy, where the original gives off a lovable big guy vibe similar to Bobo, making his betrayal all the more surprising. So, seeing how both our bad guys are supposed to come off as false friends to the protagonists, and the ones in the original seem to hide their true colors much better, I think it's only fitting to give this one to the original. Point goes to the old. Guess there's nothing left for me to say. Once again, it's all tied up, and we've come to the big deciding point, best story. This is story for the win. <laughs> Like said in the intro, while faithful to the play overall, both adaptations add a few extra scenes and more locations outside the apartment to better suit the story for film. However, the new film seems to explore this in more detail, showing us the youngers' day-to-day -day lives outside the apartment, like Walter's job as a chauffeur, Lena's as a nanny before she retires at the beginning, and Benita attending community college to be a doctor. There's only a couple of these extra scenes in the original, like Walter William Bobo discussing their business at the bar, the family coming to see their new house in Clybourne Park, and a brief shot of Walter at his job as a chauffeur. But did the greater amount of new scenes in the remake even have a point to the story? Well, I certainly think so. I mean, spending so much time in one location does get kind of old after a while. I mean, in a play it's more forgivable, but in movies you have no excuse. You need to show us more than one setting. The new adaptation also gets us out of the apartment by setting some scenes from the original play in another location. Like when Bobo tells Walter the bad news about Willie, the two go outside to talk. Or when Asagai is comforting Benitha about her big bro giving her college tuition to a con artist, they talk on the railing of the apartment stairs. Speaking of Bobo and Asagai, the two appear in many of these new scenes, allowing their characters to be slightly more fleshed out. We also see more of the racial discrimination the youngers have to experience as 1950s minorities. Like when they're checking out their new house in Clybourne Park, we see many of their race's future neighbors horrified that an African-American family is moving into their neighborhood. These scenes really make us feel all the more for the family with all the other adversities that they're facing. But let's talk about some more scenes directly from the original play. It's hard to find much to compare with them because both movies follow most of these scenes almost verbatim, just shortening or trimming a couple lines here and there. But we do have a lot more music in the new film, which helps strengthen the mood in many scenes. Now don't get me wrong, the music in the original was great too overall, but there just wasn't enough of it, and every now and then, it felt a bit off. Like compare the scenes where Bobo tells him that Willie's run off with the money and the family's devastated. Okay, if you want to have overly dramatic music to go with an overly dramatic performance from Sidney Poitier, then fine. But the scene that follows when his family realizes they're poor again and Benita won't get to go to medical school doesn't really warrant the same dramatic action movie climax score. I seen him. Night after night come in. And he'd look at the rug and he'd look at me. The sad score in the new fits the scene much better. I seen him come home night after night. He look at the rug and he look at me, red showing in his eyes, veins moving in his head. And I just want to make clear, the original is an awesome adaptation of the play overall. It's well acted, well paced, and generally well scored. But yeah, all that time in the apartment does get kind of old after a while. The new film allowed us to get out of the apartment a lot more, which was very refreshing and also handled the music in certain scenes a bit better. So by the smallest of margins possible, it's the better movie. Point goes to the new, the slightly better adaptation. That just wasn't this, sir. 